we can go ahead and start off this conversation. Thanks for so many of you coming out, taking your time to listen to this talk. I think it's going to be really fascinating, interesting, and important. Uh, I'm a member of the student group, Allied Students for Another Politics, or ASAP. And we did this project collaboratively with the Inares Project for Alternative Futures. So the Inares Project is a forum on campus, mainly focused in the philosophy department, that tries to incentivize people to think of stories and visions for better tomorrows. Uh, utopias and dystopias, as well as visionary genres of fiction, are really important for the Inares Project. And we think that part of the project of today is not just saying we're against, but trying to figure out ideas of what we're for. Uh, having a vision towards that horizon to get us on that pathway there. So if you're interested in the Inaris Project, they always take submissions from visionary writers of all sorts, and you can get a hold of them online. Just search the Inaris Project for Alternative Futures and submit us your stuff. The Allied Students for Another Politics is an organization that's radical left. We oppose capitalism, white supremacy, colonialism, and fascism, which I think is, gets us to this topic today. Uh, this book, Against the Fascist Creep, is one that I've been reading. I haven't been able to finish it yet, but I've almost plowed through it. And the things that I've really been taking away from it is that maybe everybody is a fascist somewhere working in the corners. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's important to know this history and how we've gotten to this point today and maybe start to understand the labels and the rhetoric that these creeping fascists uh, use today. Alexander Reed Ross is a Portland-based writer. He also has edited a collection called Grabbing Back. Uh, is that against the colonial land grab? Is that what um, it's against the global land grab. Essays against the global land grab. Essays against the global uh, land grab. So all of his work is incredibly useful and insightful. He also does a lot of online articles, particularly about campus activists that are trying to mobilize fascists. Uh, there are some even on this campus that are doing that exact same project. So without further ado, I just want to welcome Alexander Rivas. Thank you for coming down here, and hope this will be a fruitful conversation. Um, thank you all for uh, bringing me down here. Uh, it's really uh, an honor to be here. Um, and I guess we're going to start talking about the, the, the basis for fascism, right? Something that might be referred to as its seedbed, if you will, from the uh, 19th century and on. Um, a lot of people don't realize that uh, fascism has its roots not only in the far right, but also in the far left. Um, most notably, uh, the advocate of the general strike, Georges Sorel, and uh, his sort of following, in France in the late 19th century asserted this notion that liberal democracy was to be fought um, by any means necessary, most generally mythical violence that would shatter all order coming directly from the working class, regardless of whether or not nationalism played a role. And so within that Within that schema, okay, there's a, a, a heavily mythological return to a sort of Spartan warrior mentality of violence against the sort of bourgeois, uh, liberal, sort of um, Athenian democracy attitude. So the idea is to smash this liberal state with a kind of epic violence, you know, of Homer and um, the Iliad, you know, this sort of like um, mixture of, uh, of pure violence and politics in a way that doesn't necessarily create a cogent historical narrative, but draws on myth in order to return to a national unity over and against the liberal bourgeoisie. And so that narrative led Sorel to, uh, and his collaborators to uh, interesting friendships, perhaps, with the far right. Most notably, um, in France, in the, in the late 19th century, there was an episode known as the Dreyfus Affair. Uh, so during the Dreyfus Affair, a uh, captain in the French army, who was Jewish, named Dreyfus, was um, framed 
for helping the hated Prussians. And the army group that framed him used anti-Semitism to drum up ultra-nationalist resentment against um, Jews and against, in some ways, the working class to create a kind of cross-class alliance organized around ultra-nationalism and in particular around sort of chauvinism, you know, um, sort of athletic societies, you know, weight training and um, imperialism, uh, grand adventures throughout the world, also referring back to the United States and the internal imperialism, the internal empire of the United States in the West and creating this sort of new ultra-nationalist populism. And on the left, there was a coalition that grew around combating anti-Semitism, right? Um, so the socialists effectively joined with some of the left-leaning liberals to combat ultra-nationalism through support for Jews and support for Dreyfus. And Sorel, came after that and effectively shattered the left-wing coalition, the Dreyfusard coalition, by joining with one of the key anti-Dreyfusard uh, ultra-nationalists um, via proxy, Edward Berth was his, his sort of conduit there, in a group that was called the Cirque Proudhon. So they took the left-wing anarchist thinker Proudhon and they said, what Proudhon really tells us is not this left-wing idea of equality and that sort of thing. It's destruction of the bourgeoisie, destruction of the liberal social norms, and um, all of our violence should be focused against the center. We, we join with the far right and, and attack the, the liberal de democratic weak core. Um, and so that, that coalition of left and right became the founding, the founding kernel out of which fascism sort of developed. Um, and you can see in Sorel's influence in Italian politics at the turn of the 20th century, a real... Um, a real fascinating turning point in the discourse of Italy, where nationalists join with anarchists and syndicalists and futurists, all in one overwhelming urge, right, to, toward a revolution that will not necessarily be too risky, <laughs> right? So we'll have a revolution. Um, the working class will succeed. Uh, we'll kick out the plutocrats, we'll kick out the bourgeoisie, you know, we'll establish the new man out of science, engineering, you know, um, vast incredible feats of human progress through, uh, through national solidarity, which means that we have to entertain um, elites, but natural elites, elites whose eliteness has been um, um, tempered through the crucible of, of, uh, of violence and fighting. And um, so this is why you start finding Sorelians, syndicalists, um, and, and some leftists start to support imperialist ventures, okay, in, in, uh, in Libya. So Italy tries to colonize Libya, or conquer Libya, rather, and um, Marinetti calls the bombing missions uh, sort of sanitizing, right? Like scientific and pure and f refreshing almost. So there's this extreme sadism and hatred um, underlying this proto-fascist discourse. And so Mussolini comes out of this, right? This, this drive of some members of the left toward an imperial national solidarity forged in imperialism. And um, Mussolini actually supports the, um, the Italian state going to war uh, in the First World War against Germany and Austria and gets kicked out of the Socialist Party. So before then, 
Mussolini had not necessarily been engaged too much in um, the national syndicalist sort of milieu of Sorellian, you know, violence. Um, in fact, Mussolini was more of like an agrarian organizer or fancied himself an agrarian organizer, trying to develop this theory of a, of a middle uh, 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 agrarian worker who could take over um, in a revolutionary movement and, and lead the landless workers along with them. This kind of a Leninist idea, which is why Lenin actually liked Mussolini. Um, but in terms of national syndicalism, Mussolini didn't really have the intellectual uh, uh, vanguardism there. Uh, he was more of a charismatic personality and um, a sort of diehard revolutionist who even thought that Carlo Tresco was not revolutionary enough, like this, these other anarchists and socialists. So he was on the left, but you know, sort of muddled. And then um, what, what the final sort of breaking point between the socialists and Mussolini was, was Mussolini was calling for the entrance into World War I. And so through that, he believed that a trenchocracy, an elite of, um, of frontline warriors would be able actually finally to take the revolution over the, over the hill and, um, and, and conquer uh, uh, the lazy Italian liberal state. Okay, so um, it's 1914 that the, these sort of ultra-nationalist mixtures of, of um, um, sort of very weirdly elitist ec economists, syndicalists, and um, jingoists come into combination to form one of the earliest um, manifestations of what would become fascism. And then w after the war, it was Mussolini who said, we won the war. We were the people who brought Italy into the war. We won the war. We are the triumphant ones. Now we know exactly what to do. And so they created fighting squads called Squadristi, the black shirts, mostly comprised of veterans um, and stealing a lot of sort of avant-garde, vanguardist uh, aesthetics. Um, to wreak havoc on the left and the traditional nationalists. So basically, at that time, two competing left-wing factions fighting was nothing new in Italy. So Mussolini's rhetoric of um, basically smash the state um, sort of made him made the fascists appear this kind of edgy, somewhat leftist, nationalist, futurist group that was sort of another power player in, in a complicated hegemonic field in politics. And so they just sort of swept in through violence without really an ideological platform. In fact, Mussolini would say they're an anti-party, they're a movement, right? <coughs> And that was how they effectively ended up seizing power um, through the march on Rome and uh, effective show of force. They, Mussolini was invited into the prime minister position by the king. So um, the next year, this really bizarre far-right group, small political party, in, um, in Germany that was just one, one sort of crazed fish in a sea of you know, piranhas known as the patriotic movement, um, took the fascist victory as a signal that this is the way to go. This is the winning ideology. And that was the Nazi party. Before then, they had not really been fascist. They were just sort of one of these radical right, you know, <coughs> cesspools of cranks and um, conspiracy theorists. And after witnessing Mussolini's march on Rome, they attempted, Hitler led what he called the national revolution, right? So kind of taking some of these left-wing ideas and um, spearheading the, the uh, Munich putsch, the, the beer hall putsch in, in Munich. And he was thrown in jail briefly, um, sort of slapped on the wrist. While he, was sent, while he was in jail, the Nazi party was um, disbanded, 
was banned, and the leader of, uh, of the Nazi party sort of replacement of a Volkish movement was this uh, almost left-wing um, um, ideologue named uh, Gregor Strasser. Unlike Hitler, who was conservative and from the south of Germany, Strasser was uh, uh, raised in the industrial districts of the north, and he was very workerist. He believed in a sort of, um, uh, he believed in the Arbeitsparty, right? The Workers' Party. And he wanted to unite people under the auspices of the sort of national myth um, and a kind of uh, uh, economic nationalism um, that engaged s workers' movements, syndicates, right, in, in national solidarity. So you'd have the syndicates, the workers' groups, workers' organizations, um, in a corporatist system with all bound into the national movement, right? So basically, a way that my friend explained this to me was that um, the, your boss is in your union, right? This is not really a favorable concept for most workers, right? You don't, you, you're trying to collectively bargain, you know, with your boss and your boss being in that unit doesn't make any sense, right? But that's the, that's the idea of the co-optation of the workers' movement into nationalism. And that is the root of fascism that came out of Charles Moraz working with Berth in Cirque Proudhon and things like that. It's also known as um, integral nationalism. However, when Hitler got out of jail, he put the kibosh on that real fast. Um, the, the, the levels of, of hostility within the party had become such that um, Strasser, Strasser's right-hand man, Goebbels, said, down with petit bourgeois ideologue Hitler. <laughs> but there was a conference shortly after that in Bamberg where Hitler basically gave, um, um, gave Goebbels a sort of good position as the leader of their newspaper, the propagandist, and um, allowed Strasser a lot of leeway within the party structure. And then from there on, he took over the party and made it into a Fuhrer party of, like, he is the central decision maker, right? And, and workerism was um, um, sort of subsumed within a, the corporate aspect of it. And they, had no, they, they did not have a lot of trouble enlisting corporate support. Um, in fact, there was a really strange sort of occultist configuration that Himmler ended up developing to, to create these sort of bizarre uh, spiritual ties among industrial supporters of fascism um, in Germany. And so the left wing was finally crushed the year after, uh, the left wing of the Nazi party, right, Strasser's integral nationalism and stuff, was finally and, and, and totally removed from the party in what was called the Night of the Long Knives in June of 1934, um, where Hitler's faction and the SS attacked and assassinated several leaders, uh, quite a few leaders of the left-wing faction, including Gregor Strasser himself, as well as some of the conservative right-wingers who were supporting a kind of what they called Querfront, which is a sort of the origin of the National Front idea, where fascists join in coalition with the sort of military conservatives and, you know, and that sort of thing, and, and, and just create a far-right, you know, um, hegemonic political space. Um, and so, what? There you have um, 1934, uh, the left wing removed, and in, in um, Italy at the a similar time frame, um, fascism becomes more and more of a dogma, right? Although Mussolini had always insisted in the early years this is a dynamic sort of revolutionary thing and that you can't pin it down with ideology, it's just a movement, became increasingly dogmatic and um, um, 
uh, statist, I suppose. And um, so they enter World War II, 1940-ish, although they had been invading several places ahead of them. Um, 1940 is when they finally invade France, and then 41, Russia. Um, so I think early, you, you could say earlier in 39 when they're invading Poland, Poland right? And Norway, you know. Um, so, so anyway, past the war, okay? I don't want to talk too much about the war. The war is not my focus. Um, past the war, fascism is defeated, right? Everybody knows the U.S. has won. No more fascism. Don't worry about Nazis anymore. Denazification is a serious process that the United States takes absolutely seriously. You can see the Nuremberg trials. They're all getting hanged. You know, no more fascism. Although that's not at all what happened, right? Um, denazification was a very weak process in Germany. Um, and I say weak as an understatement. Um, in, in the US, um, numerous corporate and financial leaders had been fascist. Um, Ford, GM, um, the Morgan Banks, IBM. Um, and uh, other organizations, the American Legion, the head of the American Legion said that we are the American fascisti. Um, and the American Legion had members that were involved in the, the Black Legion, was, which was created with Klansmen by GM to smash uh, uh, strikes um, in Detroit. So fascism in the United States was alive, right? What happened in Nas the National um, Association of Manufacturers was engaged in these things. What happened was the United States entered World War II and real fast these guys changed their ideology from basically pro-fascist or fascist to anti-communist. And so anti-communism became the way of porting over fascism into some uh, acceptable American discourse. And so you wind up with people like McCarthy, right? <coughs> McCarthy is this very interesting figure because he actually, aside from being, you know, one of these very intense uh, anti-communists, he went to Germany to join in derailing the denazification process but, uh, with Aschenauer, who was a member of the Socialist Reich Party, which is, uh, which, which is basically the heir apparent, or was the heir apparent of the Nazi party after the war. So he... Also, another thing that McCarthy did was he was going to deliver a speech written by the arch U.S. fascist uh, Francis Parker Yaki to the uh, successor organization of the U.S. Nazi Party, the German American Bund, um, that was floor managed by another fascist named H. Keith Thompson. So we have a very interesting relationship here between anti-communism and fascism in the United States that takes shape in the late 40s and the 50s. Meanwhile. Denazification is happening in Germany, uh, and supposedly U.S. occupation in Italy is rooting these people out. But that's not at all what took place. So um, Hitler's spy chief, Reinhard Galen, had set up a network of uh, insurgents, of Nazi insurgents, who would rise up against the Allied occupation, right? But they never got a chance to. The, the CIA effectively found out about this formation, of course, and they turned the Galen network into the Bundesnachrichtendienst, which is uh, the, the um, German version of the CIA, West German version of the CIA. So the, basically the West ver German version of the CIA emerged from sort of rhizomatic roots of a Nazi insurgency. <laughs> And in Italy, a very similar thing happened. <coughs> Rather than just try to wipe out the Italian fascists, the US parachuted fascists behind enemy lines into the Republic of Salo, which was where Mussolini's later sort of government was uh, uh, stationed, and, and recruited Mussolini's administration into the coming regime in Italy. And they let a lot of fascists off the hook, like Julius Evola. 
And so you ended up in Italy with a, a sort of clandestine fascist network within the security services, which was tied to a clandestine group of fascist traditionalist terrorists who, beginning in 1969, after paying a visit to the Greek military dictatorship, which was helped along by the United States government, um, came back with this idea of the strategy of tension. Well, they had already fostered this idea, but, th but they learned more about the strategy when they visited Greece. So they came back and they, they, their first action was in Milan. They bombed a place called the Piazza Fontana in Milan, killing innocent people. And there were a couple of bombings as well in, in Rome. And, and the police investigation was somewhat sabotaged by the, the security services in which fascists had been insinuated, and they blamed the left. So what the, what, the, what the fascists tried to do, and did rather successfully during this time, called the Years of Lead, Ani di Piombo, was it actually infiltrate left-wing groups using these ideas of, of, of national liberation and national revolution that were very prominent, for example, in Maoist groups at the time, to say, well, we also need national European-wide national liberation against the Jewish liberal democracy, right? So right and left needs to target the center and destroy it, and we'll sort things out after that, right? So, so they blew up the Piazza Fontana in Milan. The police blamed anarchists <coughs> and rounded up hundreds of anarchists by, uh, virtually overnight. One of whom was named Pino um, um, uh, Pinelli, Giuseppe Pinelli, who uh, died mysteriously in police custody. He was a railroad worker, um, thrown out of a window, which was very common practice, especially in the colonies, like Algeria, the French OAS did it. Um, so there was an uproar, right? An uproar against the police and against fascism in favor of Pinelli, right? Where, you know, Pinelli lives and, you know, solidarity persists. And in 69, this was an important turning point in Italian history and in European history. This is right after May 68, right? This is right after the big strikes, uh, the general strike in Paris, the student riots, London, um, the Czech Republic, Poland. Um, you know, it's a sweeping movement, the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, a sweeping movement throughout the world. Mexico's um, um, uh, student movement at this time. And the U.S., of course, the Chicago um, Democratic National Convention. It's a worldwide movement, uh, mostly configured along anti-authoritarian sort of grounds, which is very new about this, and involving the general strike, right? So involving these kinds of like dramatic, you know, populist elements. And at this point, fascists realized, unless they insinuated themselves within left-wing sort of ideology, anti-authoritarianism, anti-nationalism, they wouldn't really have an opportunity to gain hegemony, right? To gain power in relation to a dynamic field of, of power struggle. So they appropriated left-wing ideology. And in Italy, this was autonomism. Autonomia. It was a movement uh, that started in the strikes in the fiat plants and, and emerged to taking over neighborhoods, to going on rent strike, to massive you know, uh, uh, shopping uh, market takeovers. They would go into a shopping market and they would say, get on the microphone and say, everybody just take whatever you want and leave. You know? <laughs> so these are the kinds of like populist sort of democratic horizontalist movements that, um, that were starting to gain real hegemony throughout uh, Europe. And, and so a think tank came together, organized loosely around the idea of the European New Right, in order to contemplate how to use this as a vector for fascism, 
right? And what they did was they started bringing back Sorel. They started bringing back <laughs> Proudhon in the way that Sorel brought him back, right? They started bringing back Morat, right? So they, 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 expressly, they explicitly said, we're going back to the seedbed that created the conditions through which fascism could become a dominant ideology. This was what they called metapolitics. So the idea there is not to jump up into the, the, the liberal you know, political field and you know, vie for election, right? It's to say all of that is wrong, the anarchists are right, the far left is right, all of that you know, sort of middle class or bourgeois, uh, liberalism is, is wrong, right? We need to create the conditions to bring about a real nationalist revolution. So that's what they embarked on. And um, one particular example of this, this is also appropriating situationism at the time, you know, trying to convert signs, symbols, and their meanings into their opposites. And um, and intervene in everyday life to you know, shake things up. And this would become also a naturalist phenomenon. They would return to some of the conservationist attitudes of the old Volkish movements that said, you know, Germans are genetically part of Germany and mixed into the biodiversity of the land, right? And they would return to paganism, right? And say, we are people who believe that the Judeo-Christian myth is over, right? We are um, returning to our roots in this land of paganism and spiritual connections and blood and soil. And at the time, because of autonomism, because of the ideas that we can, that the left can uh, uh, de-link from the bureaucratic unions and de-link from the communist party that's been overcome by Soviet, you know, um, um, uh, statism or what have you, and we can start our own movement. Green politics in the 70s became very important for the left. And so green politics became one of these sort of flashpoints where fascists not only infiltrated but took part in their development. And so you find there's, there's some incredible clashes, for example, in Germany, between the students, the left-wing students, and the, the heads of some of the green parties and larger green organizations who had come out of the Nazi party. You know, so, <clears throat> so this, is, this is the complicated thing about fascism, right? Is it's almost a chameleonic thing. You know, fascism, it's not populism where it literally is chameleonic. It is actually ordered and ideological. But it ha it's, it's ideological in a sense that doesn't find a coherent location on a traditional left-right map. Unless, like Noberto Bobbio, the idea of the left is sort of identified and defined with, the, with equality, right? If you say the left wing believes in equality, then fascism is on the right. Despite its revolutionary pretense, despite its sort of um, sometimes workerism, sometimes green ideas and whatnot, fascism is against equality. So what does the European New Right do? Well. If you believe in diversity, then you don't believe in equality because diversity means that everybody's different and everybody has the right to difference. And so um, why are we even trying to practice this multiculturalism that reduces everybody to the common denominator of McDonald's, right? So they take, you know, the left-wing buzzwords, diversity, difference, difference, you know? Um, and they convert it into, you can't now believe in equality, right? Which is a way that they have convinced numerous people, you know, ideologically, to just sort of let it slide, you know? Of course we don't believe in equality because, you know, that would be stepping on, you know, the right to difference of someone else. And it's really that position 
that's directly tied to the, the notion of France for the French, uh, Algeria for the Algerians. Immigrants are bad. They should move to wherever they're from because they're only here due to liberalism and multiculturalism and so on. The issue here is where we also find that some left-wing movements have sort of hitched onto that wagon and agreed with it and said, oh, that's true, you know? White people should have white governments and neighborhoods and culture and we should have ours. And so you find these really awkward crossovers, say with Gaddafi in Libya, whose green books outline this kind of national identity that moves from um, family to tribe to nation, right? Um, in this almost blood and soil type way, spiritually bound together with, you know, a, a sense of solidarity that is borrowed from the left or maybe emerges from the left. So there were, there were training camps for, for terrorists in, in Libya from, you know, um, sort of left-wing nationalist groups to um, fascist groups, national revolution. And the PLO also flir flirted with this kind of thing. So, so, you know, Argentina itself, like under Perón, if you, if you get, like, if you look into Perón's ideology, uh, he, he, in a letter to one of these per people who called himself a Nazi Maoist, uh, Perón um, called his ideology National Socialism. Um, he was pretty open about organizing the working class under the state. And any autonomous working class organizations would be effectively uh, pushed out, either physically or by a uh, parallel state union, which would, you would get extra perks for joining. Um, and so you end up with this thing that is led ideologically by Gregor Strasser's brother, Otto Strasser who comes out of the war, he went into hiding, and he came out of the war as, as if to say, the problem with Nazism wasn't Nazism, it was Hitler. So, we're done with Hitler, and now we have the, re the, the, the right, you know, to put, put things, you know, uh, 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 the way that they should have been if, if only Hitler's conservatives didn't take power. Hitler wasn't a real Nazi or whatever. And so there was a, there was a pamphlet in the 1980s that became pr relatively popular to some extent in the radical movement um, called Farewell to Hitler, which was a third position St Strasserist um, pamphlet that said, you know, they're Nazis, but they're not, you know, Hitlerists, right? And it was in the 80s really that Strasserism and national, Bolshevism, national Bolshevism became um, linked to the skinhead movement, right? And they started to develop these things called Freikommeraden in um, uh, uh, Germany, which means the free comrades. In the United States, the doctrine of leaderless resistance emerged from Lewis Beam and um, sort of grabbed hold of uh, what would become the militia movement um, through the Aryan nations in Idaho, right? And so throughout the North Atlantic, Strasserism becomes associated with sort of small bands of three to five militants who go around and wreak untold violence on um, liberal democratic society. Um, and this is especially associated with the, the skinhead movement uh, through uh, Tom Metzger out of Southern California, who uh, created this group after joining Duke, David Duke in the Klan, um, called the White Aryan Resistance. So he wanted to organize and consolidate the, the disparate skinhead groups throughout the United States into a Strasserist sort of organized movement where the skinheads would be the front line of a, effectively a revolutionary 
white nationalist movement, organization. And that had a particular impact in Portland, right? Do you all know that story? A little bit? There was a, this, hmm? Tom Metzger. Yeah. yeah. So there was this group called the White Aryan uh, Resistance that was organizing skinheads, and one of their ambassadors, Dave Mazzella, went up to Portland and, and organized this uh, uh, existing skinhead group called uh, uh, East Side White Pride. And um, there was an apartment that they had real close to Laurelhurst Park, on the west side of Laurelhurst Park, on Pine, I think. And um, one night, um, they're leaving their apartment drunk, and um, coming the other way down the street is the, uh, this car with two Ethiopians. Mulegata Sarah is in, is in the um, passenger seat. And so this is one of those small streets where you have to kind of uh, navigate, you know, turning in a really, uh, or like passing in a really, like, difficult way. So as they're passing, words are exchanged, right? The cars stop. Mulegata Sarah comes out to try to calm things down. Um, and they beat him to death. The skinheads beat him to death. Um, and a huge uproar emerged, finally, because there had been swastikas appearing all over Portland for quite a time. So finally, people started to, to get a sense of what was going on. Um, and the SPLC came in and sued Tom Metzger for being involved and encouraging this kind of violence. And um, in that lawsuit, they, they broke the white Aryan resistance. The movement, every time the, the movement sells a t-shirt or whatever, they have to give some of the profits to Muligeta Sarah's family in the Ethiopian community in, the, in Portland. Um, but it wasn't over then. A lot of people stopped the story there. But actually, white supremacists saw this as a beacon to go to Portland to support Metzger to turn the tide. And so there was a lot of fighting, actually, in the, throughout the early 90s. That happened in 89. But throughout the early 90s, there was a, a sort of a war between um, Nazi skinheads and anti-fascist skinheads. And I, I mean, I say war, people think that's dramatic. But at one point, a car of Nazi skinheads was pulled over, and they had like AK-47, you know, all kinds of guns. It was pretty obvious that they were you know, not going to a hunting range or a, a firing range, you know. Um, so, Portland ended up dealing with its skinhead problem in the, by the mid-90s um, through organized community defense. And by that I mean um, if somebody was harassed, this group, Coalition for Human Dignity, uh, showed up on their porch with guns and, you know, kept watch overnight, that kind of thing. Although the Coalition for Human Dignity also organized marches where thousands of people came, even though the police would revoke the permit at the last minute, you know? So this is kind of the milieu where the idea of the three-way fight comes into being. You all have heard of the three-way fight? This is the idea that de developed among anti-fascists um, that uh, Anti-fascism was not going to be a clear-cut struggle against fascism. It was going to be a complex three-way struggle with the state as, a, as an equally rogue agent. So it would be a, a, a complex struggle fighting authoritarianism, fascism, and the state. Um, and, and this is, this is a, 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 a discourse that, that took shape uh, in the, through the 90s and into the 2000s after 9-11, when the state became exceedingly repressive. Um, however, throughout this period, especially in Europe, fascism is continuing to develop its sort of um, anti-authoritarian appearance through these Freikamradschafts. Um, the, uh, um, the skinheads became very prominent in Germany in the late 80s, but it wasn't just them who were doing the violence. It turns out that 
a, a, a vast increase of violence against uh, immigrants, for example, was being carried out by normal people who got drunk and just got angry. There was a pervasive authoritarianism that was sweeping through the society. So the, 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 the anti-fascists in Germany organized through their version of the Autonomia movement, which was the Autonomen, um, they, went, they did the same rent strikes, anti-nuclear war, that kind of thing. The Autonomen had to confront the fascists in the streets, but also try to change society, to try to change the, the ethos you know, of, of society. And that was the, uh, maybe the most challenging aspect, is engaging in that cultural struggle. Because if, if the European New Right comes in and says, we want to create the conditions where fascism can take place, anti-fascists have to be strong within their communities, organize communities, and not just engage in you know, one-on-one -on -one struggle against ultra-nationalist rogue agents, right? So, um, so that sort of takes us to uh, uh, the post-9-11 era. Um, after 9-11, and it's just still sort of underplayed by a lot of scholars, unfortunately, but uh, Islamophobia becomes one of the leading agents of fascism uh, in the world. So it isn't just anti-Semitism or anti-immigration. There's this new sort of conspiracy theory that Europe is becoming Islamized, right? So stop the Islamization of Europe is what the acronym PEGIDA uh, uh, means. And it's also after when the 9-11 when the mosque, right, the World Trade Center mosque or what have you, the struggle against that, Pam Gellner, um, so, so that was called Stop the Islamization of America, right? And um, some of these experts, so-called experts, that the United States sort of um, brought in to train the FBI, to train the army about Islam, were then brought over to Europe to talk about the same stuff by people like uh, uh, Gert uh, Wilders, right, in um, Denmark. And, um, BNP type people um, in, in, in England. So, so fascism starts to sort of try to consolidate an, an Islamophobic ideology or ideological position with members of the, the populist radical right parties uh, like uh, the Front National, right, or UKIP. Um, and so, with the fall of the wall, the fall of the, the, having the, the, the Berlin Wall having fell in, in 1989 and Putin having taken over in Russia in 1999, 2000 roughly, um, there's a vast movement with this counter uh, jihad um, and the radical right um, to join with Russia against the EU because the EU is this liberal democratic system that is allowing in, you know, Muslims and immigrants and they're taking our jobs or what have you, right? So, um, so in 2008, the financial crisis has hit and class analysis is deepened, socially speaking and culturally speaking. And there is an effort by fascists to appropriate the sort of tactics and strategy of autonomen, even including Marxist analysis, which up until this point had been completely you know, anathema, other than national Bolshevism, which is part of that national revolutionary thing. But to openly adopt this sort of workerism that had been associated with Strasserism and whatnot, 
and um, you know, to don the, the black clothing and the black masks, to join in a black block of you know, militant street pro protesters in numbers who would fight with the cops and, um, and riot you know, and cause society and shake society, right? And it was these groups coming out of the Czech Republic and spreading into Germany, Belgium, and Ukraine, okay? So you all know about the Ukrainian Revolution, 2014-ish, 2013-ish. So you remember at the, at the onset of it, a lot of radicals looked at that and they were like, yeah, they're actually doing it, right? Coming out of Occupy, the repression of Occupy, radicals saw protesters, black masks, you know, pepper spraying cops, you know, um, violent protests in the streets. That's what we should be doing, right? Well, so it turned out that those guys were the autonomous nationalists, right? These autonomous nationalists being fascists. They were openly identifying with Stepan Bandera, but they were also, uh, Bandera, but they were also um, openly identifying with Nestor Machno, who is an anarchist, an anarchist fighter. How could they do that, right? How can you identify with Nestor Machno and Stepan Bandera? Well, Nestor Machno wasn't just an anarchist. He was a national hero, right? The romance of the uh, 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 Cossack you know, armies, you know, he represented the interests of the people. Which people? Ukrainian people. You know, of course, there's not really a sense of who Machno actually was. There's just an a, a, a expropriation of, of radical values um, through nationalism. The same thing incidentally happened in Spain, probably still happens, but um, starting of course in the 80s, right, this time and period of Strasserism and whatnot, with um, uh, uh, Derudi, the leader of an uh, anarchist uh, iron column in uh, the Spanish Civil War. The idea being Derudi is a specifically Spanish hero, right? He's a, he's a hero of Spain or whichever region, you know, wants to claim him, right? So you can't use Derudi in France. Stop talking about Derudi in France. Get your own national heroes, right? The important thing about Derudi is that he was against um, the status quo, right? He's a revolutionary. Right? So there's this attempt by fascists to cultivate this national revolutionary quality. And a similar thing happens in the United States with the Patriot Movement. Right? It had been going on since the 60s, this movement of especially Republicans, but also with George Wallace, of conservatives against the state. Right? Conservatism against the state, like right-wing libertarianism. Right? This is the ideology that um, fascists really ran with, especially within the Patriot Movement, which emerged out of some highly anti-Semitic and uh, uh, relationships with uh, fascism through Posse Comitatus and uh, uh, similar groups. So in the United States, it's, it's important to note that these are paramilitary formations, right? They're already paramilitary formations. Um, and in some cases, you've seen patriot movement sort of trying to unite with um, these national, these uh, autonomous nationalist formations in the United States that have uh, um, fed into the alt-right, you know? So this is where the alt-right kind of gets its grounding, right? From the European New Right, you know, um, the group that was in, starting in 68 trying to convert um, leftists to fascism through an ideological cultural struggle. Um, and the, uh, in, in the 80s, this, this attempt to make fascism into a, a revolutionary violent army, right? Um, and then um, into the 2000s with this effort to really combine left and, and right strategies and tactics. Um, along with, in the United States, the tradition 
of anti-government right wing. Um, particularly the line that leads from the Southern strategy under Nixon with Pat Buchanan through the paleoconservative movement that sort of uh, 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 departed from the Republican Party with the first Persian Gulf War. The insistence, the ongoing kind of anti-Semitic insistence that the United States is being run and neoconservatives are being uh, led by uh, a Jewish conspiracy. And that's really where you get like the prominence of people like Alex Jones, right? These sort of conspiracy mongers within this milieu th uh, that I call the, the fascist creep, right? Where you have sort of anti-Semitic right-wingers with sort of vague, ambiguous ideologies joining in the conspiracy um, um, movement, I guess. Um, that really came out of the anti-communist movement, um, the adaptation from Nazism after World War II, um, John Birch Society people who insinuated their ideas into the United States via a, um, um, uh, into the United States uh, political scene. Uh, especially via the Nixon administration's um, um, Southern strategy and the think tanks that were founded in the early 70s, um, like the Heritage Foundation, ALEC, CNP, right? Um, and so right now with the Trump administration, this sort of milieu, right? This ambiguous milieu that includes fascism, certainly within the coalition, but not necessarily centralized within it, right? It's really kind of the program of the Strasserist thing, right? The National Front type idea um, has become, has really kind of taken the executive, uh, 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 the executive branch of government, which does not make the, the, the U.S. a fascist government um, because there's still the independent judiciary to contend with. There's still a legislature that's, uh, you know, in some places uh, um, derailing Trump's um, program, right? So it's not a total state. The fascists in the United States want, like, an executive council. Like what Stephen Miller said, nobody questions us, right? That's why, you know, right? That's why it's so profoundly important that they've taken option with the judiciary. They've really gone after the judiciary. They've really gone after the media, right? So that the, that the, because that's happening, it means that things are actually kind of maybe working the way they ought to be working because, because the executive branch is actually being held in check. But for how long, right? You know, how strong are these institutions in, in place? And I'm not someone who is uncritical of the current, you know, um, the, the, the liberal democratic order. Um, I think, I mean, you find Fukuyama coming out, right? Francis Fukuyama, who, who wrote um, The End of History after the fall of the, the Berlin Wall, it's sort of neoliberalism has taken over. There is no alternative. We've defeated all Hegelian oppositions and we're in the future. Right? Everything else is just history. Well, he's coming out and saying, I was wrong. I did not realize that things could roll back this far. Right? And this fast. Yeah, exactly. So, so you know, it is a crisis point. But what he's, what he's admitting is absolutely true, right? He, didn't, he, he basically papered over the oppositions that existed. He papered over the anti-globalization movement. He papered over... Uh, Chavez <laughs> and um, um, you know the pink tide in Latin America and all kinds of oppositions. Um, those things were repressed under neoliberalism and they're coming out, right? Um, so we need to find better systems of dealing with this and I think that means that we need to find uh, uh, better political resolutions um, in terms of changing 
our community, you know, um, values, community and organizing within our communities. Not, not just going to like sort of cultural politics in that way that the, the new right does, um, because they're, they're sort of wrong about systems. Like we need to address um, how systems change. They change from the grassroots. So that's where we need to organize, you know. Um, I don't think, I think fascism has to build so much up for the violence against innocent people, you know, and that needs to be confronted, you know. And people in um, crisis situations do what they have to do. So um, my understanding of this situation is that um, I'm not sure the, uh, the ideals of uh, uh, sort of uh, what have been classified as uh, liberal multiculturalism are sustainable unless they're actually realized, which means in some ways, which means a turn to the left. Unless, you know, the Democratic Party does that and captures that sentiment, the United States government actually is far more vulnerable, I think, than anybody really understands right now. So, I think, is that, is that enough? Would you like more? <laughs> <laughs>